Hello, friends. Welcome back to season two of the S3 podcast in partnership with Headspace Studios. Today, we are in Miami, Florida, about to have a conversation with Cliff Weitzman, one of our best friends and uh, one of one of the biggest inspirations in my life. And uh, Thomas was asking me on the way here, what makes Cliff so special? And I, I think I gave him an answer in the moment that probably made sense, but I actually thought about it more. And um, I think I identified it. You inspire me to be the person that I needed the most as a kid, which is something that you uh, take to heart as a, as a personal philosophy and a, and a way of doing your life. And you are becoming the hero that you needed the most as a kid. Um, and yeah, the topic of the conversation today is learning disabilities. It's something that the three of us um, have been challenged by throughout our lives. And it's come to define a lot of things in, uh, in, in our character and what we end up doing, but particularly Cliff, because he ended up building a whole company that has the goal to help people who are challenged by learning disabilities. So Miami, Florida, we're here. Welcome. Here we Cliff just uh, moved uh, out of LA. So, you know, we were neighbors for a while and um, a few months ago, he decided uh, along with his team to, to move to Miami and, and come start a new life here. So why are we deciding to talk about this today? We, we were just talking about it a week ago when we had uh, a friend over at the S house. And I think the, the, the conclusion of what we we're talking about was that the biggest points of pain in your life be become your greatest powers. Absolutely. And um, I feel like in my personal journey, being challenged by ADHD and only recently, basically when I met you and you actually broken down what dyslexia is mm. and I discovered that I'm also dyslexic, mm. um, but that was never diagnosed because of, you know, I just never was in the system that actually helped me understand that, um, made me realize that there is, um, there's so many people out in the world that can, that are also living a life where they might think that they are incapable or, um, not as good as everybody around them when their true power is just lies in a, in a part that society maybe didn't, uh, emphasize on as much, um, as we're building our systems and setups. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. And I think maybe we can, uh, you know, start because as you mentioned earlier, all of us have struggled with some form of learning disability and all of us have kind of dealt with it or experienced it in different ways. So for you, you were more so, you knew that you had some form of ADHD, but you didn't know that you had dyslexia. Yeah. And then I grew up knowing that I had dyslexia. I found out when I was about eight. And then what was it for you, Cliff? I found out I was dyslexic when I was nine years old. I also have ADD, but my dyslexia is so pronounced that the ADD pales in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So how, how was that finding out? Like, do you remember? You oh, said nine years very old. vividly. So when I was a kid, I was the most precocious kid in school. I, and I was very ambitious. I wanted to be a billionaire. I wanted to be prime minister. I wanted to, like, invent fire, like, make a significant scientific contribution. I wanted to be a pop star. And I was the star of all the, like, the shows in, in school. And then first grade came along, and I couldn't learn how to read. And then second grade came along, and I still couldn't learn how to read. And I couldn't even figure out how to spell my last name. And I got really good at faking. So I would fake read. Everywhere I'd go, I'd have a book under my arm. Uh, and to this day, I have, like, half of the popular children's books memorized. Like, on the faraway island of Solomon's soul, Yertle the turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was sweet. The water was warm. There was plenty to eat. It's just like... No one realized, and then my dad realized when I was nine, and he canceled my ninth birthday party because I was lying to my parents that I was reading and I actually wasn't. Um, and my mom is really good at research, and she read like 100 books on the topic, and she figured out, oh, maybe this is what he has. And I got tested, and indeed, I have dyslexia. Mm. And it was the best day of my life, because for the first time, I had somewhere to hang my hat. And before that, my parents thought that I was lazy, and my teachers thought that I was slow. And I thought that I was awesome. I just needed to prove it to people. And now I was like, you see, I'm not lazy and I'm not slow. I just learned differently. And from that point on, I was obsessed with learning how to read. And I would just go to the public library every day and I would practice reading. And every time I try, I'd fall asleep in the book because reading one sentence takes me as much energy and brain power as most people take to do a long division equation in their head. Is that how one of the, the kind of, quali I guess, kind of side effects of Dyslexia? Exactly. Like how does it, maybe we can describe how it feels to be dyslexic. Cause yes. Some people maybe don't even understand or can fully relate. I think you have a good way of saying Yeah. It. 
So for context on dyslexia, 17.17% of the population has it. 5% in the, new, in the U.S. public system are diagnosed. It's very hard to diagnose. Uh, physiologically, the way the dyslexia works is uh, sometimes it's described as there's the left side and the right side of the brain. Most people, the connection between them is a straight shot. If you have dyslexia, it's this windy road. Um, and the other way scientifically to describe it is there's these things called mini columns in the brain that are responsible for sharing information. Most people have a normal distribution of mini columns and their average length. If you're dyslexic, those mini columns are further apart and they're longer. Um, so you're really good at, at pattern recognition and at creativity and big picture thinking. You're less good at kind of minute operations. So what are the things that you end up with? You're bad at spelling, what's called phonemic awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, you're bad at decoding when you're reading. Um, often you forget names, you mix up your left and rights. Um, it's actually like a series of stuff like this, but the biggest impact on people usually is either that their spelling is really bad or they're really bad at math when it comes to like following small numbers, um, or they're really slow at reading. And it's not just being slow at reading. Reading takes a lot of energy for me. Mm -hmm. So after reading a paragraph, I'm exhausted. That's it. That's like doing 10 multiplication tables at once. Um, chapter, there's no way I'm going beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and so every day the librarian would wake me up in the library um, and I just brute forced my way through it. And then when I was 13, I moved to the US. And I was like, great. I just learned how to read in Hebrew. Now I need to learn how to read in a whole new language. Mm -hmm. And I need to learn how to spell in a whole new language. And I moved in eighth grade. And I had a really amazing history teacher called Mr. Bloom. And I found an audiobook of the book online. Some random person had recorded it. And I went to Mr. Bloom, who was considered the hardest teacher because he treated you like high school students. And I was like, Mr. Bloom, listen, there's no way I'm going to write an outline of this chapter every night. Number one, I can't even type on a computer in English. Um, would it be okay with you if I came to school 15 minutes early every day and I would verbally summarize the chapter to you just while I'm learning how to like, write and read? And he was like, okay, that sounds fair. And I started the semester having the lowest grade of, in all my classes. And then by the end of the year, I was one of the best performing students. And I always found ways of How getting accommodations. How old you 13. Um, and I knew that this normal way would not work for me. So the only option was to go to the teacher and ask for something unusual. Hmm. Um, and once you do that enough, you get good at it. That's an amazing quality to be born with. Because I think for me, it affected me in a different way where it actually led me to be a lot less confident in myself. Like the French school system is very much like if you don't know how to spell, like that's the most important thing. And they are so strict on that and they grade you on it all the time. And they have, you know, like it's, it's just constant. And so I was kind of my teachers would say like, yeah, he's he's creative, but everything mm. else not really working, you know. And so I think I kept getting trying to get better at grades and I wasn't able to compute like it just no matter the effort like I, I was just struggling and I kind of understood that I didn't have like I understood that I had some kind of learning disability obviously but I didn't fully comprehend how it was affecting me like I confused my P's and my Q's yes. my like I couldn't spell my name also you know so like it, it's it's kind of sweet I found an old box of uh, like books and things from when I was like six, seven. And I literally like there's letters missing in my name. Yes. Like it's it's crazy. You look at this and if you're a teacher, you know, or even a parent, you're like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> and it's like it's it's crazy because there's you know, I was very fortunate to have my mom who was very dedicated to helping me work through this. And I got I don't know exactly what it's called. Like it, it was like um like a coat, like a some kind of a th Th therapist mm -hmm. person uh, that helped usually it's a uh, speech language yeah i think i think pathologist yeah yes exactly yeah so i i was doing that once a week but i was hiding it from all my friends like i didn't want anyone to know it was like literally i would get off a couple stops early from the bus and i would lie to my friends to say like oh i wow. have soccer practice or something you know i would just make make stuff up because i was so embarrassed like i didn't want to be the person that was the only one that i knew that had this issue wow yeah so i wish i would have had like the confidence to understand that this isn't this doesn't make me dumber than my friends it's just that i'm i'm, I'm struggling in a different way mm. but it wasn't any there wasn't any way to actually experience that because the way that your like your grades are a you're reflection of what your intelligence you're smart. yeah and i i just didn't know another way to prove it but a part of me you know i was looking around and i'm like i'm not dumber than my friends like i think i get it but i just i'm not able to 
show it in a way. Mm -hmm. And it took me all the way to end of high school to just like you, you just find different ways of studying. And one of the ways that I found was I would ask the teacher for what's the best paper like you've ever seen? Like, or do you have any copies of students? And if they didn't, uh, some teachers actually do photocopy the best papers. And if they hadn't, I would just go to the best student and ask mm. her for her paper. And then I would write it 10 times. Wow. To feel what it would be like to write like the perfect paper. Oh. And I would try to look at like, what are the words that she's using that I know oh. that aren't in my language? And then I would write all those words on a separate piece of paper and I would write those words so smart. 50 times a night. And then it just became like, my hand just started moving that way in a way. Mm. And you know, you gotta, I just looked for other habits. Like what are ways that I can learn? Cause I'm not, it's just not working. And I think that's, you know, you mentioned that some of your weaknesses can be your power. And I think in a lot of ways, dyslexia forces you to get creative with exactly. how you learn and not just take the way that it's given to you. Mm -hmm. And then those things can be applied to so many different things because now your approach to learning is how can I do this rather than, uh, you know, what is the one prescribed way to do this? And I think it, it's probably what's made, you know, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but you told this to me and I had no idea that a very large percentage of billionaires or millionaires are dyslexic. What's the percentage? Yeah, so 17% have it, 5% are diagnosed, 50% of people who are incarcerated have dyslexia. 30% of entrepreneurs have dyslexia and 40% of billionaires. And it's the type of thing when you're nine years old and you fail at the one thing that you're supposed to be good at, you have two options. One is you go down a very dark path and you say, you know, screw school. This is not for me. You go do whatever. The second path is you realize that failure is okay. Mm. And when you realize failure is okay, you realize that the only way to do it is just brute force hard work. And that happened to you. It took you 10 years of skipping the the bus and telling your friends you're going to soccer practice and in the dark kind of like copying the best students papers but by the end of high school you figured it out mm. and surprise you had a bigger challenge later which was yes theory and mm. sometimes it was down and sometimes it was up mm. and sometimes you didn't feel like getting out of bed mm. but you had already built that resilience mm. same thing to you same thing to me and so it's actually a huge privilege when you're nine years old to go and have life be run on hard mode Mm. And most people don't have the opportunity to do that, mm -hmm. and they grow up without building that muscle. Mm -hmm. But if you build that muscle of perseverance and creativity to solve the problems, because you got to work outside the system. I don't know if you ever watched the show Naruto. Uh, the first uh, couple of episodes, they're tested for this academy, and they have this test, and the test is not passable, mm -hmm. and they're ninjas. And so the only way to pass the test is you have to use some ninja powers to copy from other students. Mm -hmm. Like that's what they're testing you for. So obviously, don't cheat, don't copy other people's papers, but. <laughs> you learn how to work the system in a positive way and that applies for the rest of your life. Mm. That's great. And I, I feel like for you, when we've talked about our experiences, we're realizing that we had similar things happening, but in Egypt and I mean, you know, you felt less equipped to even be, you never had anyone tell you really what was going on yeah, and, exactly. and your teachers were like going crazy, not understanding. So, I mean, I, I grew up in a city outside of the capital. It's not, not, not a big city at all. And, you know, I, I hadn't met anyone in my life up until that point who had gone to a therapist or had seen a psychiatrist or any sort of like a specialist outside of school to, you know, to help them with whatever issue they're going through. But one thing that my teach my, all my teachers were very adamant on is that there was something very uh, different mm. with me. And I'm, I use the word different now, but the, the, the time it was something was wrong. Oh, um, because I was about to say, wow, your teachers are so inspired. To uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying it now. Um, that t to the point that I became the first student in my school to be like referred to a psychiatrist in Cairo. So I, r I still remember on a weekend, my, my dad and my mom took me to, to a psychiatrist to the first session, and they were like, oh, he's got to do these tests and do like a Q test, blah, blah. blah. And, um, and then the second session we go back and she like sits me down and she like asks me to come closer to the desk, I, the, the psychiatrist, and she starts explaining. It's like, listen, like uh, here is you, you're, you're a smart kid, but, but you have, you have this thing that is, um, that is going to like, that is going to make learning in the, in, in the conventional ways very hard for you. And she goes on to describe basically like the how I'm how I am an outlier in, mm -hmm. in the way my brain processes things um, and she goes on to explain what ADHD is and but then she finishes that by putting me on meds which mm -hmm. is very like the concept of taking medication for something like brain related or behavior related just did not exist 
in my culture and my family. Um, and I remember my fa my parents were pretty open because they were also sick and sick of my teachers just complaining because I was I also did not like authority very much so it was very really, very hard to actually get me to do what my teachers wanted me to do but at, but at the same time I was very diplomatic and polite so it was this like my parents just didn't want like they saw a lot of potential and they didn't want that to be the the thing that stood between me and and achieving all that especially in a country that emphasizes academic mm. um, like being good academically to actually make your achieve your dreams um, so I end up. Uh, go being on these meds for about a, two weeks mm. and I remember feeling at the time it wasn't necessarily the decision to not take meds wasn't necessarily driven because of an effect that I felt um, uh, that didn't make me feel good or any of that but I just felt that it, the meds were too expensive wow for for my family to to be able to like afford on 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 how regular they wanted me to take it because they want to take me twice a, want, they wanted me to take it twice a day and and I, what was the medication? It was Stratera. I don't know. What it, that was, it was it was uh, Adderall. There's uh, Adderall, Stratera, Rira, Stratera there's Vyvanse. There's like a bunch of things and they all have like different way they release in the brain. And how old were you when they prescribed that to that you? That I am 11 years old. Um, and it did those medications for the most part try to replace the dopamine that you're like seeking. Mm. But yeah, for the most part, and that, that that I, from what I remember in that part of my life, I just the guilt of how expensive it was, and me feeling like I could do, I could do more to just like be less lazy try, or yeah. try Oof. harder. And you know, I did that, and it didn't really work. But I had, as you said, like you start to develop skills in other parts of your life, and I and I was developing these skills. Um, that I just realized that like people were classified into like either academic or non-academic. Mm -hmm. I almost wanted to invent like a third way of being, which is like, well, there's academic, non-academic, and then a people's person. And that was my angle that I've kind of, I've taken my whole life. Um, and then I end up getting an opportunity to leave Egypt to go study in a completely, in a very rigorous academic system in South Africa, um, in a language that I hadn't studied in before, in English, same, you know, this is, this is, when this is how we became friends because there were all these perils in our mm -hmm. stories. So um, both of you left, you left at 13? Yeah, and you I left, left at 15. 15 yeah. yeah. Wow. And we were born like oh, 300 miles apart. 300 miles apart. Wow. Two days apart. Two days, yeah. Four really? days apart. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Same year? Same year. Same year. Yeah, yeah we're, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, then, and then I had spent some time in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, he had spent some time in San Francisco. So like, we were like, our lives keep, Wow. Yeah. We kept you guys were meant to, to yeah. meet at yeah. some point. <laughs> yeah. Big time. But, you know, I ended up going, moving to South Africa. And there I faced, I faced the same problems, except it was so amplified by all the other challenges that came with studying in a new language, uh, being in a very rigorous educational system, being away from home. And that's when I started ha needing to make these decisions for myself. Like, well, fuck, am I going to take the you know, my school's uh, counselor's recommendation to go see a psychiatrist that mm. then recommended that I go again on medication. Will I actually do that? Or should I just like really stick it through and try harder? And that was the, I think that was a big part of my torment throughout my life is that I always thought that I could try harder rather mm -hmm. than it being like I was just fine where I was. It was, only, it was only in college that I had accepted that I just, I wasn't an academic person and I shouldn't keep, trying to mm. to to fit a square in a in a circle you know and that was a, a big part of the reason that i decided to just um like double down on yes theory and and drop out of school because i just felt that at some wow. point like that was i guess that's like uh you know there's two different uh, approaches in a way and i guess I, I don't know if there's one that's better than the other you know it's either you push through mm. but push through you can't keep trying the same thing. So it's like, how do you, you know, do you pivot or do you just decide that, you know, ac academia is not for you? Because your approach was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Dominate academia. I'm going to dominate yeah. this. And you were like, you tried, but you decided that. I'm going to dominate you, you, something. You're going <laughs> to dominate something else. No, so it's. You guys took different, different paths. paths. I actually think it's more that. apparent in, in the difference between us. Because you took the approach of, of building the systems that allowed you to, mm -hmm. to deal with to contain mm. the the thing that you're going through but but for me i went complete i went to i went outside so you, you like right now i see like the you're really good at systems uh -huh. and at strategizing because you had to contain this thing and in a, in a, also in a, the french system which was even more rigorous and mm. obviously a family that like 
your family expected a lot from you, not in a bad way, but you know, you were like, you had that, you had an expectation to meet. Right. Um, so I feel like the skills that we both end up with as adults are, are very much a reflection of mm. our ways of dealing with. And I think, I think having had uh, someone also tell me that it is possible in a way or, or help me, mm. you know, I think for you to figure it out on your own largely and the only advice you got was medication, mm. you know, is, is a bit different. Like my mom's, her, the way you see it in, say it in Swedish is studio technique, which is like study technique. Mm. And she just taught me to do mind maps for memorization. She was just trying to do different ways, mm. you know, gamifying the learning, etc. And I think that helped like trying to approach it creatively and mm -hmm. having somebody tell me that, it, you know, you don't like th there is a way to do it. I, I think helped me persevere. And then over time I ended up developing my own kind of ways of looking at it. But she was always trying to brainstorm like how, how, how is she going to help me learn differently? You know, cause I just, otherwise there's no chance, no chance I'm doing the homework, no chance I'm exactly. doing the reading 0%. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's, probably one of the hardest things is like there isn't really that much structure or systems to help people that are struggling in this way and largely you end up feeling kind of alone mm. and you're you're kind of left to make your own choices and you're either lucky to have a relatively supportive environment that can help you adapt or you're not and then you you know you reach a point where you kind of have to I don't, you know, either to completely change, right? You're, you bail on academia or you just go look for something else. I'm curious what your opinion is about about this and like how the system is maybe potentially, I mean, definitely maladapted at yeah. this point. So three topics I want to cover. One is support systems, one is medication, and one is how to build your own s learning system. Uh, there was a thing that you said I thought you were going to finish differently. Uh, there's a point that someone tells you you're smart. So one of the most important things is, especially when you're going through something like this, having an adult tell you, Thomas, you are smart, Amar, you are smart, Cliff, you are smart, is so important. And there's a question I love asking people that my friend Barish taught me, which is, who is the first person who believed in you more than you believed in yourself when you were young? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you have a person like this. I'm sure you have a person like this. Usually every successful person can identify the people who thought that they were going to be successful, who believed in you before you did. And that's really important. And I would even argue that one of the biggest factors of whether you go down the dark path or the good path is if you had a person who believed in you when you were little. I actually can mm -hmm. identify exactly where the, the, the turning point for okay. me about my understanding and my learning disability. It was a TED Talk by Sir Ken Robinson, okay. who was describing, the, the TED Talk came out in 2006, and he was describing how in, in the educational systems that we've developed, they classify people as either academic or non-academic. Mm. And uh, he goes on to say how limiting that is for such a wide range of human, the human experience and people who want to do all, all sorts of things. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And I think we can't afford to go on that way. He also was, exp was explaining how uh, our experience of the world is an aesthetic one. Mm. It's one that is, you know, fully engaging to your senses, to your vision, to, to hear the sight, like all of it. Your, your, your brain is, is perfectly active as you experience something. When you take medications for uh, ADHD or ADD or any of these things, these are anesthetic. Mm -hmm. It puts you in an, in, a, in an anesthetic state. And when he was describing you know, bear in mind at that point, like I'm hearing these words in English for the first time. So the word aesthetic, it's probably one of the first times I ever mm. heard that or understood what that really means, but it really resonated. I was like, I am that type of person. I'm an aesthetic type of person. That's how I experienced the world. And when I just saw, when I had someone put words to what these medications were, because I would only go on it for like a week or two at a time at every, there's four different moments in my life where mm. I kind of caved in and I would try medication again and it would be two weeks max and I would be mm. like, fuck that, I feel so dull. And when he, when he described how it is an anesthetic and I, and I like that clicked in my mind, I was like, that will cancel everything that yes. I am to, to try and make me something that I yes. never wanted to be. And that was like, from that point, I, n I never even looked, I don't even think I, I was thinking about like my ADHD as, as such a big part of my identity as I used to, because mm. it was just like, 
I'm awesome. This is fucking, this is who I am. And this is, and I'm so good at other things. And I'm so grateful for this thing that has made me so good with people to be able to like ask for what I want and not be, you know, afraid of all these things. So, you know, when you, when you were asking that question, like who's the person that believed in you more than you believe in yourself, there's obviously people that I can point out in my childhood, but in regard to the topic of learning disabilities, it was actually this TED talk because wow. Sir Ken, Sir Ken Robinson made me believe in myself more than I, more, more than I ever had before. And I actually got to meet him in three years ago at a party and I went up to him and the first thing I told him, I was like, can I give you a hug? Nah. Thomas is there. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a great moment. On the medication front, Thomas and I were having a conversation yesterday about the fact that I don't drink and I don't smoke. Mm. And I barely even use coffee. Um, and I use the same framework that I used to make that decision around taking medication for my ADD. Mm. Because it's very tempting. Because I love improving myself. I want to be the best person that I can be. And sometimes I think, man, is it the case that I'll have a billion dollar company in like the next year instead of the next four because I take Vyvanse or Ritalin? Mm. Um, but I also... Like you said, I'm awesome. I think I'm awesome. I don't want to dull myself. I don't want to tone it down. Um, and so the framework I came up with was if I want to consider taking medication, mm. I'm going to write a 10-page paper. <laughs> I'm going to send it to my dad, my brother, you, a couple of other friends. And if I can convince all my friends that I should take the medication, then it's okay. Mm. But I'm putting like a big barrier it's so that it's not like a last-minute mm. decision. Mm. Um, and so far, I haven't done it. Mm. And, you know, you have some temptation – in college and high school to do it, but there's also a temptation afterwards when you're doing real work. You need to focus on something. And so ideally, you can design your life in a way where you can work in your zone of genius. I would say the temptation right now is probably higher than it's ever been yes. because I actually get to do something that I love, that I see how my brain sometimes doesn't allow me to be like operating at my full potential. And it's so fucking tempting to be like, oh my God, life would be so easy if I can just sit down this one day and write and answer back all these oh emails God. or like, right. you know, review. But also, it's not but like then a you rob bad... yourself of the MR. Yeah. 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 I think it's, it's I, I don't have, uh, you know, much experience medi with medication or understanding it or whatnot, but it's also not like a bad option for everyone, right? I think it's just, you gotta, as you said, you gotta figure out if it's the right thing for you at this yeah. point in your That's life. Right. You know, I think 11 is probably in a, you know, I, I, it sounds very young to do something like that, mm. but if you're, you know, you're 26, 27, if, 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 if it's something that you're like, you can take on a small dose once in a while, I don't think it's the end of the world as, you know, I think from my mentality is to try to avoid long-term addictions, but if it is a mental health condition that is like serious and is taking over parts of your life that, as you said, you feel like is getting in the way, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I, I still like, I, I it's funny because we had that conversation before and I, I was also, you know, thinking, oh yeah, it, it is definitely a valid option for people. But I, I just think, I just don't trust the system that diagnoses people with it. That's yeah. why I'm like, at this point, and I like ops for the solution, right? If you have a exactly. hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. Yeah. Everything in society is pointing at the fact that we are opting for solutions all like all around. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, no, you're not going to put meth in someone's body just right. convincing them that, you know, they're going to be able to focus a little more or do homework better. So I'm like, I'm still like I had a moment, especially, you know, in this past year, I, I was struggling with my mental health a lot. And I and I just felt so stuck in the place that I that I was at. And at some point, I even had the conversation with Thomas, like, should I consider fucking like trying this again as an adult? Maybe my mm. maybe I'm, my systems are more complete or developmentally I'm in a better place to be able to ha and then I just like I had a moment of clarity and I was like no fuck no I, I I'm not nearly done with like fully trying to 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 optimize this thing for myself because I yeah I think reframing it to be like your gift rather than your curse yes. is is definitely the way to go about it but then you can move on to systems right yeah so let's talk about systems yes yeah. yeah so i'm very good at systems cliff <laughs> is the best person that i've ever met with systems he's like the way i describe him to people is he's the best hacker i've ever met he's a hacker of all systems yeah in the best way possible so right i'm 13 i moved to the united states i'm like stupidest person in the class because i don't even know how to speak the language that's like thomas um, <laughs> 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 and I'm like, okay. I'm saying that because he was actually like, that's, he was labeled as that, or that's your perception of yourself. I, mean, I, I, I was bottom of the class for a while. Yeah. Like literally the lowest scoring student. So yeah, you can say I was the stupidest person. <laughs> okay. So I do this thing with Mr. Blue, my history teacher. And here's the key. This is like the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. I really wanted to read Harry Potter. Everybody was reading Harry Potter. I really wanted to read Harry Potter and I would fall asleep all the time. 
So my dad started to read Harry Potter to me. And I absolutely loved it. And he would record himself on a cassette tape. And I'd walk around the house listening to this cassette tape over and over when he was at work. And he couldn't come read the book to me when I was going to sleep. And then when we moved to the U.S., we found an audiobook set of Harry Potter in English. And I listened to that 22 times in a row. And to this day, I have the first chapter of Harry Potter memorized because I listened to it so many times. How many pages is that? It's a lot of pages. It's actually how he met. It's how he met. That's really long. It's how he met his ex girlfriend in college. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was walking. They both started uh, reciting. I was was walking. I I was actually on a date with somebody else. We ran into a group where she knew someone. I knew someone. We started chatting, and someone asked me about one of my classes. And it's called uh, Classics of Political Economy. And the professor has a thick Scottish accent, talks to you about the book and the mud. And someone's like, "Oh, you could do accents. What other accents can you do?" And I did like, uh, like the first beginning of. Harry Potter in a British accent. Um, and so Taylor does the next few lines and then I do the next few lines. Um, but that opened my world up. And so after Harry Potter, I started listening to a bunch of other books. And Eric and I were talking earlier, I can listen really fast today. I listen at 800 words per minute, 4X speed. Um, 4X, I was listening to you listening. I couldn't even understand anything. You know when you, when you clip. rewind uh, <laughs> any audio and it's like goes like, that's what it sounded like to me. <laughs> and so what happened was I was listening to Harry Potter at like 0.5x speed and then 0.75 and then 1x and then 1.25 and then 1.5 and 1.75 and 2x and 2.5 and 3x and 3.5. Um, and over time, I got really good at listening fast. And the key is you want to match the listening to the speed at which your mind is working. Mm. And that way you don't get bored. And the thing is, my brain moves really fast, and so does yours, and so does yours. And most kids listening, your brain moves really fast, especially now with like TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. Even WhatsApp now has double speed. YouTube has double speed. Netflix has double speed. Everybody listens to Lecture Capture at like 2.5x speed. Um, Listening fast is a skill. And I'm lucky that from the age of 13, I worked on this skill. Mm -hmm. And so I, on average, for the last 17 years, have listened to two audiobooks a week. So 100 books a year. And I can attribute basically almost all of who I am to having unconditionally loving parents and siblings, to listening to 100 books a year, and having the experience of needing to overcome dyslexia when I was young. And so in high school, there were not audiobooks for most of the stuff that I needed to listen to. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I'd convince other kids to come study with me. They're like, oh, study buddies. They didn't realize they were signing up to read the book out loud, and then I would explain anything that both of us didn't understand. Um, Freshman year of college, I realized that also most of my books for college didn't have an audiobook. So I built this tool for my computer that would scan any text, I'd click a keyboard shortcut, and it would read it with a computer voice. And then I set it to be able to read really fast, and I built an automatic speed ramping system that with time increased the speed without me touching it, so I got really fast. And then it could scan physical books. We need to break down this, because he's, he's, he's talking very quick. He's just, he's describing it. He's like, oh, yeah, I went to college, I just wrote this thing. This thing that he's talking about is what he's currently working on, which is a com- like a massive company that is offering a very uh, significant solution for people with learning disabilities all over the world. But I want to... I want to go back and like dive deep sure. into into that because you've it's the tool that you're offering to the world right now is one that was it's it's the story of like invention out of a need because you literally totally. built it for yourself. Totally. So like I want to know more about the circumstances around this time. How old are you? How long yeah, have yeah. you been in college? Yeah. So the first version of Speechify, essentially, we had this summer reading book called Sons of Providence. Never read Sons of Providence. It's a terrible book. <laughs> I spent the entire summer trying to read this book. I finished like half. And I'm about to go to this fancy Ivy League school. I'm 18 years old. I'm not about to come and not having read a summer reading book. So I beg my mom to read it to me. And she does. But she has to work. She doesn't have all this time. We finish another quarter. So now it's the night before school. I still have a quarter of this book left. I'm freaking out. My brother Tyler helps me hook it up to my computer. Um, and it reads the thing. We crack the digital rights management that's on a Kindle. I, yeah, that's what I was going at. <laughs> um, and then we have it read it and record it into my iPhone, and then I listen to that on the plane, and it works. And I'm like, wow, I just read the book. And I walk into that first session confident as hell. Turns out nobody else had actually read the book. <laughs> um, and I was like, well, this thing worked. So then we had a bunch of PDFs we were assigned for engineering classes. I studied uh, renewable energy engineering at Brown. Um, and so I just built a thing that would use optical character recognition to scan those PDFs, extract the text, and then read it to me. Um, and so when I was in school, I built a lot of things. I built like 36 different products, everything from iPhone apps and websites and like 3D printed skateboard breaks. And I learned how to build stuff with computer science. 
um, and when I graduated, my thesis was I want to be the person that I needed most when I was young. And the thing I really needed was someone to read my books to me. Um, and I knew I didn't want a job. I'm also not very good with authority. In fact, I'm terrible with authority. Um, and I was like, all right. So I got two of my professors to sponsor me to stay at Brown for another year. So I had an ID. I was on meal plan. I could kind of visit classes, did not pay tuition or have homework. And I was just working on my own things. And the two criteria I had was one, I wanted to work on something that you could not have built a year ago with the technology that currently existed. And two, it should bank on some sort of shift in cultural behavior. Mm. And so the shift was people were listening more. Seven years ago, podcasts, no one was listening to podcasts, no one was listening to audiobooks, no AirPods, no Clubhouse, and now everybody listens all the time. It's becoming a primary form of information intake. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a subcategory of artificial intelligence called deep learning, and I was reading a lot of research on that and I implemented that into Speechify. So now you can listen with Gwyneth Paltrow's voice, like it sounds like a real human, and it can teach you how to listen fast. It's a Chrome extension, so it'll parse. Basically, we built this thing called the backend platform thing. Speechify now is 57 people. Um, so it's a big organization yeah. that's internationally distributed, um, and there's a lot of really, really good, like world-class engineers there. So the backend platform team parses the entire internet and figures out how to read every website, how to skip the metadata, how to recommend it to you, how to read your emails, your Google Docs, physical things, it's a really popular iPhone app. Um, and so it solves the problem. Like it's the thing that I really needed when I was 10 years old. Yeah. Um, so that's what it does. Um, and and it, is, it is truly a brilliant tool. Like to just be able to, to put the entire internet at people's disposal through, you know, through allowing them to hear it is really, um, is a game changer. Yeah, we think about it as giving people reading superpowers. Yeah. And the idea is to let you listen to the internet, exactly. Yeah. What do you think the, um, in terms of infrastructure for learning disabilities on top of this? I mean, this is an amazing, uh, you know, step forward. Do you, th how do you, do you guys think like we should do a better job integrating mm. students through this, you know, cause we describe it as like a superpower. Yeah. Right. So in a way, like being forced to figure it out <laughs> has taught us many, many great things and put us in a place that we might not have ended up otherwise. And so you don't want to like coddle, you know, people with dyslexia, mm. but you also need to help them understand that for those who are giving up, you said 50% of inmates are dyslexic. Like, how do we help those people, mm. right? The people that are not, that are not being helped by the system and don't understand that what they're going through is a predisposition that they're born mm -hmm. with. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that those feel supported so that it isn't a choice that you have to make as a kid, but it's it's something that you understand is possible mm -hmm. and that all you have to do is X, Y, Z. You know, I know in Sweden, like, there's a lot of different ways of getting support. Mm. Um, like, they've been super supportive about people that are that are struggling. And in a lot of countries, I would say almost most countries, there isn't really. No. Like, unless you're, you're very you wealthy parents that can afford, like, tons of extra support or whatever that you have to pay for. But, like, should that, sh is that a school responsibility or is it, like, through, you know, conversations like this where we just educate people to, you know, you found out through a TED Talk and that seemed to have had like create a spark within you that helped you move past it. You know, I think even though I had a supportive system around me, I wish I'd understood better what it was exactly. And, and that it, you know, the, the ways that I was choosing to interpret it psycholo psychologically, I wish I hadn't had those. I think mm -hmm. like the, the, the fact that it was forcing me to learn differently was a positive thing. But the, the fact that I was taking it as a negative and as like a problem that I had that I was trying to fix was not a positive. And I know that it's impacted me in, like all the way until today, you know, I still have moments in my life where I feel like I need to prove myself mm. to people because I've, you know, I, I kind of was born with that kind of, you know, environment. I was like always feeling like I needed to show people that I wasn't stupid or that I wasn't dumb, you know, and, and, and that's not been a great thing to have, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't put great energy out there. It doesn't make me happy. Uh, you know, it's made me way more competitive than I think mm. I is, is, a hel is healthy, you know? And so I'm now having to kind of unlearn some of these things to be able to move uh, like a better member of society and a happier person. And so right. it's like, you know, is it parents? Is it, uh, you know, just general education of society to understand what this is? Is it the school system? Like how, how do we help people that are, that are struggling? Exactly, so my opinion is that it's not the school's responsibility. This is a very controversial opinion. People will get mad at me for saying this. But look, I think that governments are inefficient. I think the schools are inefficient. I really believe in entrepreneurs. Um, 
And I believe in if you're a kid anywhere in the world, you should just be able to go on the internet and have access to everything that you need. I think schools are not efficiently run to begin with. So what, I'm gonna give them another burden that I really care about? Yeah, it is actually their responsibility, but I just don't expect them to actually pull it off. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna fix it. Initially, I fixed it for myself with audiobooks and the like MVP, minimum viable product version of Speedify, and then I made that public to everybody else. Um, I'll tell you the other things that I do. I'm obsessed with typing fast. And like I always try to convince other people to learn how to touch type fast. Mm. I try to convince other people to learn how to code. And you can learn how to code via video, videos. You don't need to be good at math. You don't even need to be able to spell. You just need to try and practice and you'll get it. Um, and so our responsibility is to tell your story, tell your story so that people, oh, that's a great idea. I'm gonna go find the smartest girl, not the smartest, the, the girl who's performing the best in my class and ask to borrow her essay so I can write it. I'm going to define myself as an academic, non-academic, artistic, people, person, whatever it might be, um, and realize that there are so many different ways for me to live through life. Mm. The important part is to build that kind of framework in your brain of who you want to be and the systems that you wanna create in order to facilitate the best learning for you. So for me, the, I learned I'm an auditory person. Mm -hmm. I can listen really, like if I practice, I can understand really well when I listen. And so in high school, I joined the speech and debate club. I was the, the, the president of our speech and debate team. I got really good at talking. I got really good at listening. Um, and so I doubled down on the things that I was stronger, stronger at. At the same time, I worked my butt off to learn how to read well. Mm -hmm. um, and so you gotta do, you, you, you gotta cover the bases and then you gotta exploit the things that you're good at. And then for me, I, I did go down the academic path because I love learning. Mm -hmm. um, and also I just really enjoy college. You're someone who speaks to a lot of crowds of people who are, who are challenged by learning disabilities. What's the most common question that you get from? from how do you build you the confidence? Hmm. By far the most common question hmm. is how do you get that? Um, you know, I owe so much to the fact that I'm willing to talk, to, I was willing to talk to teachers to hmm. get special exceptions. Every day, I'd get a special exception. That's why, actually, when so you important. when you were saying, like, I think I think there's a part of it that is you're not you're a naturally gifted person with the confidence. But I actually think I would argue that the majority of it came because of the progression of you having to ask for all totally. these things as a kid. One hundred percent. Being proactive. Yeah, like that proactivity is definitely what what put that in you. Yeah, you just got to push yourself to start. Seek yeah. discomfort. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think it's having the. You know, you know, I think some people are, I mean, you know, you said that you felt born with confidence to go do these things. And I think for anyone who isn't to just, just try, right. Start asking people for help. You know, I think one thing that I did as well, uh, which sounds like you did just talking to teachers, so you important. know, cause then if they can see that you're really trying, you also gain a lot of empathy from them. You know, like if uh, at first I was like back of the classroom type of person, and then I forced myself, I'm going to sit in the front row. So every time because then i can't i have i you know I'm, I'm on the i can't be messing around talking with friends drawing doing whatever i used to do so that was one thing that i did and then going to you know realizing that every at least school wise every test is kind of a game and once you figure out what the rules are like school and tests to me used to be this elusive hypothetical thing that was like this giant cloud of challenges that i would never understand and then i just approached it as like class by class what is the teacher actually really looking for like, what is it that gets, you know, a B versus an A? And then you can really break these things down and asking for help and going to the teachers to find out, like, what are these things? Oftentimes, they're actually willing to tell you what they want, right? Because they want their students to do well. And then bit by bit, you kind of learn that th th there are ways where you can not just try to figure out on your own, but really reaching out, right? Like being like, can you help me? You know, and same with in, in my case, you know, the, the A student in the class was super happy that I went and asked her for help. You know, you, you'd imagine that she would be super competitive and wouldn't want to show you. And maybe there are some people like that in the world. But she was, like, flattered that I wanted to photocopy her paper. She was like, oh, wow, great. Yeah, like, who else has ever asked her to do that? And I think it's, we almost corner ourselves. And I still do it to this day. I'm, I don't, I'm, not, I'm still not great at asking for help, even though I feel like I learned it. Mm. You know, it's a thing that has to be, like, a constant kind of reminder and thing to come back to. Um, I have this, I just kind of feel like I end up wanting to figure it out on my own. I'm just like, screw it, I'll do it. Um, but I'm trying to relearn now what I learned 10 years ago, that reaching out for help and trying to figure out how to build systems and, and people around you that are willing to help is like such a pivotal skill even that you can apply across everything in your life, whether you're building a business or trying to become a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find that a lot of people, um, even in our community who, 
you know, potentially want to even be involved with us or do things with us. They, they just haven't figured out a way to ask the right way. And mm-hmm. a lot of people that we end up employing or working with or bringing along were bold with asking, you know, and they were confident in what they were able to bring. And then they showed up and they were here. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes, uh, you know, coming from a, from a genuine intention of wanting to help or wanting to learn is I think people, most people really connect with that and respect that. And, um, I find that it sounds like for your experience as well, Mm. asking for help. And you said you were, uh, you weren't an academic or non-academic, you were a people person, Mm. probably open endless amounts of doors that would otherwise literally never have been opened to anyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, people always throughout the history of, you know, our existence on YouTube, people often see that I, you know, I have decent people skills and I'm always able to go up to people on the street and ask them for all these things. And the most like the most common question that I get also is like, how do you how do you do that? How are you so good with people? And it's literally because I had no other option but right. to be you practice. It's but, like lifting weights. Yeah, right? exactly. You, yeah. you do the first little one and yeah. then you get good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And that's and this is really where, you know, the, that reframing of instead of it being like, oh, the thing that you struggle with. Even I stopped saying like, oh, I struggle with ADHD or I struggle with depression. Mm. I say I'm challenged by because, mm. uh, you know, in my mind, I'm like. No, it's, I'm not, it's this, yeah, it doesn't have power over me. It's actually, it's a challenge that, I've, that I'm constantly learning from and it's constantly bringing, uh, bringing out the best of me because, because it's, at least it's allowed me to be who I'm meant to be rather than be forced to, to be an engineer or a doctor or any of these things that, you know, I would have I done if I had just gotten the grades that were expected of me, which is the craziest thing. Like when I think about it now, Without my ADHD, without my learning disabilities and all the things that are that have made it so hard for me to be in school, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been who I'm meant to be, which is so wild because there's no scenario where I would have had the grades and you know been let been let to like do other things. Mm-hmm. So I think about the thousands of people around the world who are deprived from experiencing like their spark and who they truly are just because they were just put in a system that convinced them that this is where they need to go. Mm. And that's why like, that's why we are obsessed with your mission. Mm. That's why we asked theory invested in, in speechify because, you know, you know, outside of it being a brilliant business and what you're doing with your team here being like some of like the best work we've ever seen, just like what it will actually bring to the world is something that we, that we want to see because it would have been the greatest help that we could have had as kids. And, uh, I remember, Maybe a year ago, I showed you from 2015 when yeah. we had, when when I w- was working on the the f- wireframes for the tech startup that I was working on in Montreal before I met Thomas. One night, I I wrote down like basically like the you know in a one line just that the idea for an app that can help read things for people, which basically ends ends up being Speechify, and I meet Cliff all these years later. So it's uh yeah, it's been super serendipitous, and I just feel like we're we were meant to meet like. Speechify and Yes Theory were, were meant to cross paths to, you know, to bring this kind of uh, storytelling and, and sharing of experience out to the world. I will, I will say that the one thing we miss the most about living in L.A. is going on adventures with you guys. Aww. We always think about the adventures that we did in, uh, in Malibu, Joshua in Tree. Joshua Tree, skydiving. Yeah. <laughs> Aspen, there was like, oh my God, like the, the going in the ocean under the full moon, like there's so many. So this is like one thing that we really learned from you guys is we're very like focused on work. We're always focused on work. Now every month, at least month, well, at least once we'll go on some adventure somewhere. We'll like book an Airbnb, we'll book some flights, we'll go do something. And that's something that we really owe to you guys because it's something like we're all adventurous, but we just never prioritized it. And now we give it a little bit more priority. That's great. <laughs> you're welcome to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, it also plucks you out of your environment. Oh, you know, so good. the big one of the main side effects of seeking discomfort is you get to then come back to your life and have like a, you know, you can have like an objective point of view of how how things are going and what you want to change. And I love the kind of like the the thought of you have to go after and be proactive about what you want. Because change doesn't just happen mm. to you, right? Like you have to seek it. Mm-hmm, you have mm-hmm. to be proactive about talking to people. You have to create systems that allows you to solve the problems that you have no matter what. 
and, and put yourself in the front of the front of the class to, to, to show that you're here to learn, you're here to try. Exactly. And then not give up along the way, no matter how many D's or C's you need to get. Like it's just about continuing to push through and not losing faith because everyone is is born with genetics that have some set of predispositions, but it doesn't yes. mean that anything can't be learned. Yeah. And I think and you gotta learn yourself. Yeah. Like figure your, yourself out. Yeah. That what gives you energy. Yeah. And where you have a predisposition. Yep. And figure out the things that you want and then go after them. Yeah. And so for me, the way that I sought that and figured it out is I read a lot of biographies about other mm. people's lives and saw mm. how they lived. And then I went and met them. And right now they're speechifying investors or their friends or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, and I did the same thing by going and doing adventures, like doing things that most people wouldn't go and do and seeing how did I like that? How did I like this? Um, and then spent a lot of time thinking, a lot of time writing. And then figure out a direction, and then once you figure it out, you gotta go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and accept that whatever disability you're told you have, it's figure out a way to to leverage it into uh, exactly. into a superpower. Yeah. Because whatever exactly. it is, it already is. There are endless living proofs. Yeah. yeah, that uh, you know this is not something that uh, has to hold you back. Even if it's it's not gonna allow you to fit into the traditional system. If anything, that's an amazing opportunity to break out of the system and figure out a way to play within it and then branch out of it and do your own thing. Um, you know, I think, uh, as you said, I don't think any of us would be where we are today if we hadn't been born with what we were born with. That's right. And so accepting and owning that and then surrounding yourself with supportive people, I think is, you know, only going to make you a better person. And I'm excited for everyone listening. Yeah. If someone who has a learning disability, who doesn't know or has never felt like, accepted or understood or never had other people speak about it because it's not something that it's not top of mind there's so many other things happening in the world that i feel like it's not a an issue that people talk about that often it's not sexy it's not a headline in the news and it's know? often reduced by you know mostly older older generation being like you're fucking lazy we didn't have the shit when you were when you're your age and um and it's sometimes it's really hard to you know to try and speak against that even i mean you're putting Instagram ads and you're having people call you lazy for inventing a, a tool that, that helps people read. So I can only imagine like, you know, my family was very different, was a very different family where I grew up. Anyone else it would have been met with, what were you talking about? Just work harder or be, you know, Stop grounded lazy. more. Yeah, yeah. But my parents just saw that I wasn't mm. lazy. So that's why they, they were inclined to act in a, in a different way. Mm. But for the majority of the world, they... It, it is a very lonely place to feel different and to feel... And like, I'll just put one offer out there. If you're listening to this and that is how you feel, shoot me a message. So my email is cliff at speechify. My Instagram is cliff Weitzman, C-L-I-F-F-W-E-I-T-Z-M-A-N. I remember how to spell it now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so if you feel that way, shoot me a message. I'll message you back. Um, and if you're excited by speechify and you're like, hey, I'm an engineer, I'm a designer, um, I'm in this place where I'm seeking and I'm actually willing to work, shoot me a message and tell me that you want to work with us. Yeah. Hopefully, this can be a, a place for for anyone to practice acceptance and mm. and then looking at your situation and, and seeking out ways to improve it and seeking out people that are willing to help you improve it. Because I think, um, you know, as a society, we need to do a better and better job making people not feel like aliens when they are different. Mm. And I think this is a, a great conversation as a as a first step in our ecosystem for those who do feel different growing up that you're not different. If anything, you're different in a positive way. Yes. And and it's and a, you're welcomed and accepted and you're smart. Yeah. Just go fifteen feet forward. Yep. And seek. I love that. Great. That's a wrap. Great combo, guys. That is awesome. Woo.